Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly is. Before we start, and in case you're wondering, yes, this is my second attempt at the same video since I had mic issues in the last one. I promised I would redo it, so I finally found some time to get it in, to redo it for you guys, so that you have a good quality video to watch. Next, let me do my usual disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research. Next. Let me just put it out there that this video does cover some pretty heavy, gruesome topics. So if um, you think that might be too much for you, I would, prob I would probably suggest that you uh, click off of this one and you come back to the next one because I prefer that you, know, you take care of yourself first. And now let's start, okay? Belinda Van Crevel. She grew up south of Sydney, Australia. Her and her brother were raised by their father, Jack Van Crevel, after their mother walked out on them when Belinda was two and her brother Mark was three. To the outside world, Jack was a devoted single father. He did everything that he could for his children. He tried to give them the best of everything. He would lavish these kids with gifts and be wearing the latest fashions and designer names. When Mark decided that he wanted to join a motorcycle club, his father bought him the best motorcycle that he could afford and top of the line safety gear to make sure that his kid was safe. But behind closed doors, Belinda would tell a very different story. Belinda would claim that her father was a safest, that he would BEAT her daily. She would claim that they were in fact so bad that she believed that she would die from them. She would also claim that he would go on and would not stop until she could barely stand up and then he would kick her until she would lose control of her bowels. Along with this, she would also claim that her father would essay her. But her claims would not end there, okay? Belinda would also claim that he would be a T and SA her brother Mark on a daily basis. And that the ABUSE that her brother had to endure is the reason that he became a serial K I L L E R. Saying that Mark is not responsible for the things that he did. Rather, it is her father who is to blame. He's the one that should be in jail. Not my brother. Belinda blamed her father and was set on revenge. Saturday, June 13th, 1998, at Lake Lawara, in Australia's seaside state of North Wales, the Kanahuka Road corner shop was closed. This was very unusual because the shop owner, 60 year old David O'Hearn, promptly opened his shop every single day at 7 a.m. Lake Lawara, I hope I'm saying that right, I don't think that I am, translates to a pleasant place near the sea, and it is said that that pretty much sums it up. Because David was such a creature of habit, a family friend alerted David's family when he failed to show up to open the shop. David lived alone, so his sister Chris went over to his house, and when she arrived at David's townhouse, the door was unlocked and she would walk into a horror that she could never unsee. David was laying on the living room floor right by the front door. He had, did, he had been dismembered, decapped, and disemboweled. His intestines were laying on a silver tray that was close to his body. His dismembered hand was on the sofa and a pentagram was written on the wall in David's blood. David's sister would obviously call 911, I mean, and when first responders arrived and they first walked into the scene, they went into the kitchen. And when they went into the kitchen on the counter, they saw David's head staring back at them. 
David's family could not even begin to think who would do something like this to him because he was just so beloved. He always tried to help people. He was the type of person that if somebody came into his shop and they were unable to pay for something, David would just open up a tab for them, no questions asked, and they would just pay him back when they could. That's the kind of guy this person was. He was good looking, suntanned man with a great smile. Um, his family did believe that he was homosexual, even though he never actually came out and admitted it, but, and he never openly had a boyfriend either. But either way, his family wouldn't have cared. They just loved this shy, sweet David. The last time that David was seen was on June 12th. He closed his shop at about 5 p.m. At about 5.35 p.m., he ran into a friend of his 89-year-old mother. He told his mother's friend to let her know that he would be by to see her the following morning to visit her and to check up on her and that he loved her. After that, he got in his car and he went home. The next day, investigators found the home of David turned upside down, almost like there had been a robbery, except nothing was missing. Investigators would bag four knives, a corkscrew, a small saw, and a razor that were all in close proximity to David's body. There was also a pair of gloves that was neck that was placed next to David's head in the kitchen on the counter. Yep. Fingerprints were taken from the gloves that they found and they were ran through the database and invest but investigators got no hits. So that would mean that whoever committed this brutal crime has either never committed a crime, not even a petty crime or they've never been caught but yet they could but yet they commit this like this is mind-blowing right because you don't typically go from being a stand-up citizen to this <laughs> um yeah officers also believe that this murder could not have been premeditated but rather a murder of opportunity because whoever did this did not have a set method and they just used whatever was at hand. There was blood splatter all over the living room, which indicated that most of the blows to David's head were done while he was laying down, with the official cause of death being blunt force trauma to the head. A crystal wine decanter with blood all over it was found and determined to be the weapon that was used. Most of the mutilation that was done was after David died. So that that's good because that means that, you know, hopefully he didn't suffer too much. Because of all this, police decided to look into a satanic angle, okay? So that's when they come across a man named Keith Schreiber. He was known to dabble in this and he lived very close to David. Actually, he lived a few houses away from David. So Detectives decide to pay him a visit. The police knock on the door. Schreiber's roommate answered the door and he told the he told officers that Schreiber wasn't home. They asked if they could come in and take a look around and his roommate said sure and they let him in. Officers go to Schreiber's bedroom and when they walk in they find drawings of figures that have been decapped and disemboweled. Um, the elements of Schreiber's drawings were very eerily similar to the scene at David's house. So now detectives really want to talk to Keith Schreiber, okay? They decide to head over to his job at a fish market where his job is to fillet fish with a very sharp razor and quick precision. So now police are even more interested in Keith Schreiber, okay? He lives a few doors down from David. He fillets fish with quick precision for a living. The drawings in his by the drawings by Keith in Keith's room almost mirror the scenes at David's home, and because Keith was David's neighbor, he probably knew him, which means that he most likely would have let him into his home without thinking anything of it. But if this case does not teach you to not judge a book by its cover, 
nothing will. Because Keith had a rock solid alibi. His boss stated that that night, Keith slept at his home because they had a very early morning shift the next day at the fish market. And during the time of David's death, the boss would vouch for Keith that he was at his home and there is no way that he could have, he could have done this. Then, June 26, 1998, just two weeks after David's death, police get called to the home of a very well-known public figure, Frank Arkell. Like David, Frank was killed inside his home. There were no signs of forced entry and chances were that whoever had done this had been invited into Frank's home by Frank. Along with that, the scene at Frank Arkell's home was not very dissimilar to the scene two weeks prior at Dave O'Hearn's home, okay? Frank was found in a granny flat behind the house that he lived. There was a huge amount of blood and blood spatter at the scene and on the walls. Just like David, Frank died from substantial blows to the head. But while David was done with a wine decanter, Frank was done with a lamp. And the cord was also tied around his neck. And just like in David's death, whoever did this chose to use whatever was available to them. So it was another crime of opportunity and another crime that was not planned out. This was not premeditated. After Frank's death, three tie pins were inserted into his face. All right, crazy. Three tie pins were inserted into his face. Two were sewn through his eyelids and a third was wedged deep into his cheek. So police began to have a very strong feeling that David and Frank's deaths were both done by the same person. Police also found a pair of black Nike track pants and a pair of blood-stained Colorado hiking boots at Frank's home. Because Frank was such a huge public figure, he was always in suits and ties, so a pair of Nike track pants and hiking boots would not really go be in his wardrobe. The Nike pants were also turned inside out, which would indicate that whoever took them off was in a hurry to change. There was also a fingerprint, okay, that was found on an old lunchbox that held the tie pants. The print that was found at Frank's house was not an exact match to the print that was found at David's house, but it was a different finger. Police ran it through the database. Nothing came up. Just like David, they found no match. So at this point, police are at a standstill. They don't, I mean, they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. The only sure suspect that they thought they had was cleared. So they decided to start looking into the Colorado, into the hiking boots, okay? Investigators found batch matches from the manufacturers that would tell them where the boots could be purchased. From there, they would follow up on all the sales records for those shoes. They found six credit card slips, okay? All six owners were eliminated. And in fact, some of the people that they spoke to were actually wearing the boots while they were being interviewed. So now they're at another dead end. This would mean that whoever the person was that left the boots at Frank Arkell's home had paid for the had paid for them in cash, which means there's literally no way to track it down. Next, detectives look into Frank Arkell's background. And it was described as opening up Pandora's box of possible suspects, okay? Because Frank Arkell was not a good guy. Um, or allegedly not a good guy, I should say. Because he did get acquitted. At one point in time, Frank Arkell was known as Mr. Wonderful because of everything that he had done to promote the city as a politician. But then that was basically crushed when he was charged but acquitted of essay crimes that involved boys and men. It was reported that he would slip them something and then essay them. After his acquittal, though, 
even more people would come forward with similar claims and charges against him. All of them relating to being a pedo and child's PRN. Police interviewed every single victim, okay? Because let's face it, every victim and or their parents had an amazing motive to do this. But police would clear every single one of them. So now police are desperate to find the link between Frank and David before this happens again. They were both homosexual. They were both in their 60s. Short of that, they had nothing in common, okay? David owned his little shop and led a very quiet, modest life. He did not want to draw any sort of attention to himself whatsoever. While Frank was a high profile politician in the midst of a scandal. I mean, they could not be, and like they are completely different sides of the spectrum. David did not have anything in his life that would even remotely suggest that he was a pedo. His only real secret was that he hadn't come out of the closet yet. And truthfully, that was his business and his business only. And he wasn't hurting anyone. And it was his prerogative to share if and when he wanted to. So when the media hinted at David being involved in Frank's shady business, obviously and completely understandably, David's family was furious. Stating that anyone who knew David knew that he was a kind-hearted, gentle man who would never, ever be a pedo. From there, police began to look into other unsolved deaths in the state, especially on ones that involved deaths of homosexual men, okay? That's when a man named Trevor Parkin comes across their radar. Trevor's death occurred six months prior to David and Frank's deaths, okay, in Gleb, which is located near Sydney City Center, okay? And with trains and highways that connect the two cities, it's not uncommon for people from the smaller city of Wollongong to travel to Sydney for, to find work. And when Trevor's belongings were found in a train at Waterfall train station, which is the railway that um, connects the two cities, investigators concluded that whoever was responsible for Trevor's death most likely lived in Wongong. At the scene of Trevor's death, there was an entire handprint that was found. When police took the handprint and ran it through, and ran it through the prints that were found at David and Frank's scene, there was not a match. So once again, they are back to square one. I mean, what a letdown for all three families, truthfully for all three families. Next, police decide to ask the media for help, okay? So they had the media show the Nike track pants and the Colorado hiking boots that were found at the home of Frank Arkell. And that's when they finally got some information that they could work with. Uno reverse card. You ready for this one? You are not ready for this. No, I didn't see this coming. I'll tell you that. A woman will call up, okay? And identify the clothing. When the woman called up, she said that her ex-boyfriend used to wear very similar Nike track pants and hiking boots. And then all of a sudden, he would wear them all the time. And then all of a sudden, he just stopped wearing them. And she if she would ask him about it, he would get agitated and he would fight with her. She would also claim that her ex-boyfriend took a keen interest into the murders of David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell and followed the news articles religiously. The ex-boyfriend that the woman was talking about was a guy called Mark Van Greville, who was so scared that he was the person that was responsible for these debts and, and even more importantly, terrify that he would strike again, uh, please put surveillance out on him, okay? Also, 
looking into him, they find that Mark Van Crevel had recently changed his name to Mark Valera via a deed poll. Okay, so in order to change your name legally in Australia, you have to pay 150 Australian dollars. You have to return all of your original documents like birth certificates, driver's licenses, things like that. And for somebody who had no job and drifted between homes, it was kind of peculiar that he would spend that amount of cash to legally change his name. While under surveillance, okay, this thing has, this story has so many twists and turns. Under surveillance, police saw Mark Van Crevel hanging out with friends. One of the friends that he was hanging out with in particular caught their attention. And the reason for this is because the friend was Keith Schreiber. Schreiber was the initial suspect in the David O'Hearn case, the neighbor that was a couple doors down that worked at the fish market. They were hanging out together. While under surveillance, police also find out that Mark would live at Keith's house from time to time. Okay. And they find out that the person who opened the door that day to let them in to search Keith Schreiber's home was indeed Mark Van Crevel Valera. Let's just, was indeed Mark Valera. Ain't that some shit. <clears throat> so, now what do they do, right? Now what do you do? Well, that day, the day of the David O'Hearn case, the day of the David O'Hearn death, Mark Valera went down to the police station and he gave the police a, um, a statement, um, giving them an alibi for Keith Schreiber for that day. And he signed it. The statement was taped up and Mark Valera signed the statement. Great. So, so police get this idea that they're going to take the fingerprints from the statement that Mark Valera signed giving Keith Schreiber an alibi and compare them to the fingerprints that they had from David and Frank's scenes. Oh, you know. And the prints come back as a match to being present at David O'Hearn and Frank Arkell scenes. Okay, so now his prints are at both the scenes. But just to be sure, they keep surveillance on him and they try to get their hands on anything that they can for DNA. They do that all the time, really. Um, like if you throw, you know. So when Mark Valera throws out a soda bottle, police collect it have it tested for prints, and the prints end up matching to the alibi statement as well as the prints from the crime scene. Done. They have their guy. So all they need to really do now is build a case and arrest him. As police are getting ready to close in on Mark Valera, he walks into the police station. He turns himself in. He walks into the police station, he confesses to everything, and he turns himself in. At his trial, Mark Valera claimed that the motive for it was due to a homosexual advance that both men made towards him. Okay? So, he basically says that both of these men made homosexual advances to him, and that triggered memories of when he was a child and his father would essay him and claimed that this would cause him to snap and kill them. In the end, the jury ended up rejecting Valera's homosexual advances. Okay, August 18, 2000, shortly after midnight. Keith Schreiber would arrive at the home of Jack Van Crevel. 
he would enter the home through an open window and grab an axe that was found propped up against a garage door. He would enter the room of Jack Van Gravel, stand over him and say, you effing pedo, you'll never touch another kid again. Why did you want your father dead? Why? Because of the damage he caused. So you blamed him for all the monstrous things that Mark did? Yep. Mark's innocent. Mark's the innocent one. He was the victim. Not David O'Hearn. Not Frank Arkell. Mark. Then he would begin hacking at Jack Van Crevel. Yelling at him, why won't you just die? Schreiber would leave the room and he would come back with a fire poker to finish him off. He would strike Jack 25 times till he was finally gone. After that, he would get a knife and he would hack him another 16 times. Okay. The whole time that this was going on, Belinda and her two year old daughter were in the bed together listening to this happen. Her two year old daughter asked her, What's happening to Poppy? This poor baby. This poor baby. When Schreiber was done, he exited out of the same window that he entered from. After it was over, Belinda puts on a children's video for her daughter, Tia, to watch. And then she decides to drive to the police station an hour and a half after it was all over to report a possible intruder. So, police go out to the home of Jack and they find his body kneeling beside his bed. There's a huge amount of blood on the bed and the curtains. And the three murder weapons are, and the three weapons are laid out very neatly on the bed. Belinda tells police that she believes that Keith would be the type of friend that would do this to her father for her brother. So she's basically setting the stage for my brother, Mark, made, asked Keith to do this for him as a favor because my brother and Keith are best friends. Taking zero blame for everything. The police are not picking up what she's putting down. They're not buying what she's selling. And I will tell you why. She was very calm the entire time talking about this, talking about the murder of her father she shows no emotion even though this just happened okay it doesn't take police very long to find keith okay and arrest him it takes even less time for keith to admit what he had done and why he had done it is there anything you can tell us about the incident that occurred last night with mr jack van crevel i'm done it Within 24 hours, police arrested Schreiber, who quickly buckled, convinced he'd rid the world of a dangerous I'm told him this is for Mark. Bastard. You'll never look another kid again. Keith certainly wasn't. Thank you. Did you ever go on out with Keith, Schreiber? No, I never even thought about it. <laughs> you ever had any relationships with him? That he had done it because of the alleged ABS, AB, that he had done it because of the alleged ABUSE that Jack had done to Mark and Belinda over the years. And I truly think that he truly believes this. This, he really does believe this. That much I have to give the guy. He does. He truly believes that he was doing this for his best friend and the girl and his girlfriend. Because their father was a terrible person that would, you know, essay them when they were little. And was touching Tia, the two-year-old granddaughter. So, 
because the evidence fits Keith's version of events, his trial is short, sweet, straightforward, straight to the point. He ends up being sentenced to 16 years, okay? But police still are not convinced that Belinda was innocent, right? Even though she steadfastly denies any involvement, first off, why didn't she call triple zero, which that's their version of 911, Australia's version of 911, or why didn't she run to the neighbor's house? Think about it. It makes no sense. Nobody would do that. Jack Van Gravel's ex-wife and Mark and Belinda's mom, Carol, showed up back into their lives shortly after Mark was arrested. And Carol, the ex-wife, had actually warned Jack days before his death that he was in danger and that his daughter had put a $2,000 hit out on him. And he didn't take her seriously. He didn't believe her. <laughs> but according to Carol, Belinda told her everything. That the plan was for Schreiber to hack him into little pieces and throw his remains into the Kiama blowhole, which is a scenic coastal town about 30 minutes away from him. Police also found evidence that Belinda had given Keith money. And although she does admit to giving Keith money, she denies that it was for murder, that it was to murder her father. And you can't prove it. They can't prove that it was. In the end, Belinda ended up getting six years for the solicitation of her father's murder and was released from jail in June of 2007. After her release from prison, she would receive almost $200,000 from her father's estate stating that, and she would state that all she wanted to do was to just get on with her life. Walking free, a second chance. I just want to get on with my life. And soon after, Belinda Van Crevel fell in love with carpet salesman Marshall Gould. They had a little boy and it seemed Belinda could finally be happy though not for long. I just remember her eyes, they just went black. Just went like that, it's just, you know, the color of her eyes just disappeared just like that, it was just black. In July 2013, fueled by a concoction of alcohol and prescription, Belinda flew into a psychotic state, stabbing Marshall six times, almost fatally. She just started belting straight into me and you know, telling me she wanted to kill me and you know, I couldn't work out what was going on. And then she ran to the kitchen and she grabbed a knife and she came running out of the kitchen. She said, she just started with, I'm going to have to kill you, Jack, you know. Like, she, Jack. Jack. The, the name of her father. The name of her father. When she first felt... Wayne Gould, Marshall's father, rushed his stabbed and bleeding son to hospital. In the morning, I, I get a phone call. I, Where's Marshall? And I said, Marshall's in hospital. What's he doing in hospital? She had no idea. No, none at all. I said, you tried to kill him last night. I wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't. I said, you did, you stupid bitch. You tried to kill him. You stabbed him about ten times. Nearly lost his arm. So then she's in tears. She did not remember any of that. Mm. She remembered nothing. Does that scare you that you've got no memory of that That night? did, yes. It did. I woke up in the morning and I was just horrified. I, I didn't know what had happened. I just woke up and I had my son with me and there was blood everywhere. And she would end up serving two years for that. She would end up serving two years for stabbing Marshall. This chick keeps getting away with shit. I, I don't know. She just she keeps getting away with shit. Mark Blair is still serving his um, two, two life sentences. After Belinda got out of jail the second time from stabbing her baby daddy, um, she sits down for an interview. The um, person conducting the interview hands her the, the book from um, Mark's nightstand, and when she tells her to look down the list, and Belinda sees her name on her brother's hit list as one of the victims. I don't know if you've seen this. This is the book that the police found at Mark's house. Do you want to have a look at it? 
the A to Z of C. I'm just glad that you have something of his that I could... It's quite sad. Hmm. Have a look down that first column at the names. There's a lot of names here, yeah? My name, your name. Did you know you were on that list? No, I didn't. Not until now. Looking at that, he wanted you dead. He's just, this is just him being angry. So it doesn't bother you that your name's there? No, of course not. Because when police contacted the other people on that list, they mm -hmm. were terrified. I would think that yeah, well, would be a more honest response. Yeah, well, they didn't grow up with him. I did. Yeah. I know him better than anyone else. Oh, okay, guys, if you're still here, thank you. Um, that was a long one. That was a crazy one, though, right? Was, um, let me know what you thought about it. Um, leave me a like. Leave me a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. It would mean so much to me. Um, I just love you guys. You're just the best. Um, if you have any suggestions, leave them down in the comments, and I will see you guys next time.